Michigan. A humble state known for its abundance of fresh water and home to over nine million Midwesterners. The Grand River flows through the center of it all, stretching 260 miles across the state, making it Michigan's longest river. Beginning in the city of Jackson, the Grand River flows northwest through the cities of Lansing, Grand Rapids, and Grand Haven, where it spills into the vast waters of Lake Michigan. After an 85,000-year ice age, glaciers began to melt and plow their way through the land, scooping up the earth and melting it into the many basins it left behind. Thus, the Grand River was created. I started swimming when I was three years old, so my swimming experience in the Grand River goes back to 1933 or so, you know. At that time, you could actually see into the river. It was clear enough that you could see things. I'm a member of the Grand River Band of Ottawa Indians. I was born and raised here, and as far as I can know, everything I've been raised on has been around and on the Grand River. As a kid, I grew up on a river in Midland, and uh, I just enjoyed every day out in the summer playing in the river, and you just don't see that here. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential. It's a beautiful river. Um, it flows through urban settings, but then, you know, just five minutes outside of downtown Grand Rapids, for example, you can be in a very remote section and you almost feel like you're, you know, out in the, the boundary waters or, um, you know, really remote areas. So there's something on the Grand River I think that everyone can enjoy. So growing up in Michigan, uh, I think there's this natural affinity and love for water, whether it's our lakes or our rivers. Um, I've always been connected to nature and uh, I love being out on rivers. Uh, but when I think about the Grand River, I love it largely because it runs through our city. And uh, it's been a part of so many of my experiences. Really, I've spent a lot of time on the Grand River just for fun, boating, kayaking, uh, fishing. Um, taking video and uh, you know learned about it from uh, a fisheries perspective as well. I also got to do a, a project as a master's student on a threatened species of fish that not many people know about that lives only in a few rivers in the state, including the Grand. And also, it, because it's the longest river in the state, it had more impact than most. It's 265 miles long, which makes it the most important river in Michigan. This was our, this was basically our Garden of Eden, you know, it, it, Mesopotamia of our people. Everything was here for our people to exist, you know, and our people still live here. We still have many Grand River people that are, have never left this community. Our tribe had 19 villages along this river. We're, 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 not a, we're not a band as most tribes are a band, but we're bands. The 55 treaty for our people was signed here, so we signed treaties here. I really appreciate the river and the stories of the river because that's where my family comes from. My family wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the river. And to realize that there's still my family and other families that have been here forever and that are still here on the river and living on the river is amazing to me. And I just want to let people know that there's still people that have been here and that are still here and that will probably be here long after me. And that's awesome. And it's a lot due to the river. My opinion on reintegrating the rapids back to, I guess, a natural state, more of a natural state, I'd actually think it'd be kind of cool to see how it would be. I'd like to see actual people using the river more as how our people have been using the river forever and it'll be nice to be able to get back on there where you can put canoes in there and really fish and start using the land more. Well, our tribe, the indigenous group from this area, are, we existed here hundreds of years ago before any non-natives here. I'm, there's probably about 500 of us that are left in this community. In 
The first would be from about the time of settlement, say of European sort of settlement in the 1830s. It was very much a transportation conduit, a source for food, a way to reach the interior. This is a very densely forested region, a lot of white pine, mixed oak and oak openings and pine forest. So it's hard to get in. So the river is an access point into that from the, into the Lake Michigan. So the early dams in Grand Rapids were uh, basically on small tributaries or creeks in that, um, Indian Mill Creek, Colebrook. Then it was about, uh, well it was 1866, William T. Powers was interested in building a west side water power canal. And to do so, he would need to build a contract with the east side and construct a dam that would then um, hold more water, uh, build a larger pond behind behind the dam that would uh, be able to be utilized as a, a resource a reservoir for water in both the east and the west side. This wing dam, which was built in 1849, still existed um, in 1867 after the uh, 4th Street Water Power Dam was completed. And uh, William T. Um, asked the east side Water Power Association to tear that dam down because it was directing more water towards the east canal uh, than the west and um, it kind of went against the contract of the 18 of 1866. So um, thinking sometime in the 1870s it had been there for a few years and still wasn't getting torn down and William T. Powers sent a couple crews out to dismantle the Horseshoe Dam and uh, was driven off by those from the east side. And so I don't know if that actually is where the beginning of the east side, west side, there's a little contention going on there, but it would either be the second or third crew would head out to this uh, Horseshoe Dam led by William T. Powers. Um, it was said in the papers at the time that he had gone off with an ax to tear this thing down and uh, don't know if it ex exactly happened or not, but we know that by the late 1870s, that dam no longer existed. July of 1880, uh, with a di electric dynamo from Brush Electric, they set up a temporary hydroelectric power plant and for two months had it operating there. Eventually did move it further down the West Side Power Canal where it would be um, for about a year until a building was actually built and constructed. It would be, in 1881, the very first hydroelectric power plant in the world. It operated from that 1880 date that I mentioned to uh, uh, 1956 was when they actually turned it off. July 1883 will always be known as the time of the Great Log Jam. It was thought to be the largest one in history, and it began in Lowell and then went 47 miles almost to Lake Michigan before it could be stopped, and it threatened to destroy the whole lumber industry in the area. It caused five bridges to get knocked out because they were piling up so fast, and there were millions of logs heading towards Lake Michigan, and that would have been a real catastrophe if it had gone in the lake. It would have been really treacherous navigating the lake with all of that. So something had to be done, and nobody knew what to do. <laughs> and they had and used pile drivers at the time, which were steam-powered barges. And from there, they would drive pilings into the bottom of the river. So that seemed like the only option. But when they tried to do it, the companies running those barges just looked at it and said, well, it's impossible. But one man decided, well, maybe it wasn't. His name was Job Walsh, and he ended up being the hero of the day. He and his men were able to divert the river around the log jam. So the, the river flowed the way it should into Lake Michigan, and all of the logs were corralled into Stern's Bayou in Grand Haven. As you go into the eight to later 19th century, the river in really becomes 
almost exclusively industrial, especially uh, places like Portland and, and Lowell, uh, you know, further inland, uh, Ionia. You're able to then see it in Grand Rapids, most especially, to where you begin to shape the river uh, to serve that sort of piece. You have flood control, uh, you have the great flood in 1904, so therefore you begin to, to build heavy concrete walls to try to corral the river, which of course makes it flood further away from the city. In 1900, a boy by the name of Bert Botsford noticed a crack in a reservoir. Anticipating the reservoir to burst, young Botsford ran down the streets of Grand Rapids, knocking on doors and urging people to evacuate. Due to his bravery, many people were saved from millions of gallons of water that poured over several blocks of Grand Rapids at a depth of 10 feet. But as the 19th century comes to a close, the railroad really starts to drive, to drive that business out. And increasingly, you use the river as sort of an industrial waste sort of depository as with the city's waste. I and mean, when you have a, a sewer system, there is no uh, you know, sort of formal sewage plant until the 1930s. So into the 1900s, the, uh, the river is essentially a, a place of business. The city faces away from it. Uh, my folks been here for a long, long time, since 1928, right here on the edges of the Grand River system. So we've in, uh, you know, 80 some years seen a lot of Grand River changes. The thing I remember the most is the Grand Haven Eagle Auto at Tannery. Uh, you could go by in your boat and the, the river down, it's right downtown Grand Haven, the river would become totally dyed. Some days it'd be red, some days it'd be green, some days it'd be uh, brown, uh, some, you know, uh, depending upon which dye they were flushing. And uh, you'd go by there, there'd be hunks bigger than a, a, a basketball of hide and, and hair and stuff. They were actually, there was a pipe that big around that just came out of the break wall and you'd see all this crap just running into the river. That was it. They weren't hiding it. It was totally legal at that time. By the mid 20th century, in many ways, uh, the river is a muddy, sludgy trickle at high mark in the summer. Uh, it's really a, a very difficult place. And as a historian, we ask ourselves, you know, what did these people know? Did they know it was a problem? Absolutely. The newspapers and commentary are filled with this complaint that the river smells, it looks terrible, what have we done to it, but it's very useful, we should not do that, well, but that's still useful. There's a lot of back and forth to that. And really not until the 1970s and over the next uh, 40 years will you begin to transform the river uh, into places like Anabawin Park uh, near the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. Park comes first, and then the, uh, the museum, the river walk, the creation of Sixth Street Bridge, the fish ladder. You begin to have a, a greater consciousness of the river as maybe something more than just sort of a, a, a useful you know, tool for waste disposal or an industrial power source of an inexpensive variety. The Mayor's River Cleanup actually started long before I was mayor. Uh, it's initiated and supported and organized by an incredible organization we have in town called WEMIAC, uh, the West Michigan Environmental Action Council. And so they started the, the Grand River cleanup years ago. Um, my predecessor, Mayor Hartwell, was actively engaged in it. And so when I became mayor, I was able to uh, take the lead in partnership with other mayors from the community. We come together for the Grand River cleanup to support it because the Grand River runs through a number of cities. Uh, so typically it's Mayor Heisinger from Walker, Mayor Pohl from Wyoming, uh, and myself, and then Mayor Moss from Granville. So we come together on this Saturday in September with thousands of volunteers and we all get out there with our bags and we join our community in picking up trash and cleaning up our river.
Our organization, like I said, is really focused on the restoration of, of about a two-mile stretch of the Grand River. So when we think about the entire river, 260 miles long, um, we're really focusing on a pretty small stretch. Uh, but we're really, again, focusing on that urban stretch through downtown Grand Rapids. So we look roughly, our project limits are looking at um, from Ann Street on the north end to about Fulton Street on the south end. And our goal really is to restore the namesake rapids that our city was named after. At first glance, it sounds wonderful. We want rapids back in the river. The river naturally had rapids, and that whole downtown area has been changed dramatically as the city has grown up around the river and the river has been managed for things like flood control and really some of the coffer dams or beautification dams were put in there to spread the water out through the channel because if parts of the channel dried up historically the city would stink because the river was in such bad shape so some of these things have outlived their uses um, the, the areas that we're focusing on just in our project area there's five dams um, the 6th Street Dam is the largest of the dams in downtown Grand Rapids, and then there's four smaller low-head dams. Um, and our current design plans to remove uh, uh, all five of those dams as the river flows through downtown. And that will have an impact, not just economically, but also environmentally, um, in, in my opinion, socially. What's being proposed is to take the current dam out or modify it substantially so that fish could potentially get through it and boats could uh, potentially get over it or uh, kayaks could get down through the area where the current dam is and then build another dam upstream about a little more than a mile upstream. And then the real kicker is what will this other dam look like? In general, I would say removal, removal of any dam, whether it's this river or, or any other river, is, is, is typically a good thing. Now there's a number of factors that you have to go into that. Um, especially when you look at some of these larger dams that have created big impoundments where people have homes on, on these now kind of lakes. You know, obviously that's going to affect a lot of um, social elements as well. Um, but I think in general when you look at, at dams and, you know, when you build a dam in a river, it, it not only does it change the natural flow of that river, but it begins to provide barriers for fish and other species that live in the river. The plans are still to have some kind of adjustable crest inflatable barrier. Why would you need an inflatable barrier? Well, if you took an eight-foot dam and put it a mile upstream, you would create massive flooding in the northern part of Grand Rapids, which of course we don't want. So the river, it's variable. It floods at certain times a year, in certain years, and at certain times it's, it's very low. So you prevent flooding by lowering when the water's high. However, you need to block lamprey. So the theory is you put the barrier up when lamprey are migrating upstream. It supplies the uh, natural habitat for birds and birds and animals and stuff. Oh, right behind you, see that stick? Grab that white stick out of that thing. Uh, what do you think that is? I found it out here. I found it out here this fall. It's a beaver stick. So we do, we do have, you see how the beaver's been chewing on the ends uh, and took all the bark off it. Uh, we do have, a, uh, I hope people don't bother them, uh, a redevelopment of real beavers, not just muskrats, I mean beavers, you know. Salmon and steelhead that are migrating upstream to spawn, you know, they hit those barriers and it, unless there's some route, a uh, fish ladder or something around them, um, they can't get up, up upstream past that barrier to spawn. Um, there's a number of fish that are not jumping fish that can't get over barriers or can't get over fish ladders. So when you think about um, those fish and species that are trying to access other important uh, habitat areas, they're blocked by dams. So removal of a dam um, allows those species to connect to some of their, their natural habitat areas, um, but it also kind of again allows that, re restores the flow of, of the natural river. We've got a number of species that live in the river. We have uh, invasive sea lamprey, um, and there's actually a treaty between the U.S. and Canadian governments to manage sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. Um, so we have to be very careful about how the, uh, the removal of the Sixth Street Dam, how that affects sea lamprey migration. Well, if you're familiar with sea lamprey, they're, they're blood-sucking fish. They're uh, very damaging to the Great Lakes fishery as a whole. 
the habitats of all those species um, have to be considered. You know, we have to uh, think about how the effects of blocking and treating sea lamprey, how that impacts the, the other mussels and other fish. Now, what we have today is a fixed crest barrier. So it does not move. It's roughly an eight foot drop all the time. And the reason that's important is because it is effective at blocking sea lamprey, an invasive species, from moving upstream. You know, there's a fish ladder next to it, so some fish can jump up the fish ladder successfully. The fish ladder contains a lip with a, a, a kind of a step with a lip on it that prevents lamprey from going up over the dam via the fishway. We have the snuffbox mussel in the area that's already successfully breeding and has populations right below the dam. We have lake sturgeon that already make it up and spawn uh, successfully in the Grand River below Sixth Street Dam. Uh, we have the threatened river red horse that's also in that area and has populations that we don't know a whole lot about, but um, if we just assume that whatever is done is good, that, that may not be a good assumption. We have to look at the details and we have to take each dam removal project um, for what it is on an individual basis. And then you look at the, the communication that needs to take place just with the public so that the public understands why we're doing this. And it's really kind of why these projects take so long and, and why we've been working at it for as long as we have. We had natural rapids here in the river, so that's our, our goal is to really restore that uh, river as much as we possibly can. Obviously, we have some limitations with that. Uh, bring back the rapids and then create some other recreational opportunities and enhance the you know, natural, environmental, and ecological function of the river. Again, we kind of have this idea. When you look at a, a big, muddy river, people tend to think dirty, gross, yuck. Uh, it has lots of wood in it, you know. That's it, not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the Grand has its problems, but uh, it also has improved on a lot of counts over the years. People say to me, oh, you eat fish out of there, oh. Well, it's interesting, if you look at the actual contamination of fish in the Grand River of a certain size, let's take a, a big carp, that's the bottom feeding fatty fish, it's gonna have more PCBs and fat soluble uh, contaminants than most any other fish around. If you take a, a carp of a certain size out of the Grand River and compare it to a carp of the same size out of Lake Michigan, the Grand River fish is going to be cleaner. And that surprises people, but it's true for, for fish down the line. Um, the Grand River is a river, so it does flush out and it has cleaned up uh, over time. And the actual toxic contaminants in fish are generally probably not as bad as people assume. The public can really sort of have an impact on what you do with the, with the river and, and to really sort of shape that is, is in one very simple way is to actually be mindful of it that there is a river. I mean, not, every, not every day do you drive across the river, do you come into contact with it. But it is worthwhile to think that it is there, it is uh, connected to your sort of your life. But I've planted five trees because trees soak up stormwater and they're good for air quality as well. Um, so you can plant trees and you can add a rain barrel and capture rainwater on site and then reuse it for um, water in your plants or other things like diverting some of your rainwater, you know out into rain gardens or or into your lawn instead of putting it on the sidewalk which then flows into the street which flows into the catch basin which goes out to the Grand River um, washing your car for example is another thing that you could do if you wash your car on your grass you know you stop that soap and everything from going into those catch basins anything that goes into a catch basin outside your home uh, at least within the city of Grand Rapids now goes directly to the Grand River River has always been a part of our, our lives here, whether we've turned our backs to it or, you know, in the early days with the Native Americans, it was their way of life, it was their way of food, it was their way of drinking. I really appreciate the river and the stories of the river because that's where my family comes from. My family wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the river. It really gives people a spot where they can really get out there and get with it. and. You take the marshes here with the cattails and stuff uh, would be one of the few things in the state of Michigan, say you're out there amongst the cattails, that would be exactly 
like the surrounding if you were here a thousand years ago. There's a number of organizations, not just in Grand Rapids and West Michigan, but I would say all throughout the whole Grand River watershed. Um, organizations of people that care deeply about the Grand River, um, reach out to some of those organizations and, and really learn more. It's our responsibility to take care of this earth that we are a part of, uh, and water is so essential to that. The spirit of the Grand River aided many people throughout history and to this day continues to be the heart of Michigan's advancements. From logging to electrical power, recreation and wildlife, the river took care of us. Now it is our turn to take care of it.